protein with the proper um, um, amounts of uh, genocinides. Um, they help with both drive and with the ability to get an erection. Ginkgo biloba. There was a study done with a couple of thousand men in which they utilized ginkgo biloba, and they did write about 120 milligrams twice a day. Now, you have to watch ginkgo if you're on blood thinners. You can't uh, do high amounts or any of it if you're thinning the blood already with things like Coumadin or Warfarin types of products. Um, ginkgo, 75% of the men surveyed said they had an improvement in their blood flow and ability to maintain an erection. And that's a pretty substantial uh, figure uh, when you consider that was such a large uh, pool of uh, men that they did the sample testing on. DHEA, there was a six month uh, long study of between 25 and 50 milligrams is what was found appropriate based upon body weight. Uh, and uh, the majority of the men also saw an improvement in libido and male performance. Cordyceps. Uh, cordyceps we use a lot for breathing, for people who have asthma or for energy or endurance. 800 milligrams twice a day of a particular CS4 strain helped with libido and impotence. Um, there are several herbs, and I've written uh, Murapama down, and 500 milligrams three times a day. Oftentimes you can get these male formulas that will have you know, some Yohimbi, Marapama, um, it'll have um, Damiana, some of the herbs that have been studied to help with male um, sexual performance. They can be helpful as well, too. Now, I didn't want to leave homeopathy out because there are certain home homeopathic medicines that you can take that can aid and abed some of the emotional aspects and physical aspects of impotence. So, you know, you can go hopefully uh, find a good book on homeopathy or actually better yet have a homeopathy, homeop, homeop, doctor of homeopathy give you an analysis and get a proper formula for you of what maybe might be able to help you as well too. Home, homeopathy is a little bit more complicated in that you have to know the emotional aspects of an individual to determine the proper uh, medic, medicines and dosages as well too. Anyway, that's kind of it in a nutshell. I hope that helps. Um, the next time we talk, we're going to be talking about the women's portion, and that's the difficulty in, in a woman being able to uh, reach an orgasm and, uh, or some of the drive involved uh, with even wanting to even have sex. So I hope this helps. We're going to be moving on next to our fitness portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the fitness portion of our show. And since we're entering the swimsuit season, I'm getting questions on what you, um, what you can do to tone things up. And I have a lot of ladies who are noticing a little bit of droopies uh, in their bus lines who've asked me to help or asked me at the store what exercises they could do, some of which do not want to go to the gym. And so I pulled out some old isometric exercises that I thought may be able to help tone and help support uh, the breast line as well as the muscles surrounding it so that we can get a little bit of a lift. Um, and oftentimes too, after certain surgeries, particularly breast reconstructive surgeries, obviously you cannot do weights. And these are some exercises that were shown to me uh, by a trainer that can be utilized to help tone some of the muscles during recovery and get certain circulation into the particular area. Now, in the old days, they used to have us go like this. We switch around like this. In today's times, we work it from all different angles. We're going to hit with what we would call the lower portion of the muscle tissue, the middle portion of the upper tissue, and then the upper portion of the what are called pectoral muscles. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to work the whole support system along with the little supports in here as well. If you do these isometric types of exercises, holding them for about 30 sec seconds at a time, and you work your way up gradually as best you can, not only are you going to get some toning in the particular pectoral muscles, but you may see some suspension support in, in the shoulder girdle as well as your arms. 
I hope that exercise is helpful. Next, we'll be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano. Thank you for that intro. First off, we're going to start off with a little bit of pharmaceutical trivia. The question is, is what class of diabetic drug makes, lowers your blood sugar or blood glucose levels by first making you fatter? Yes, making you sweet like a sugar plum. So your mom wasn't completely wrong. But think about that till we get to the end of the segment. Now, radiation protection. Obviously, it's always been a concern recently because it's been a lot of the news. And the Japanese did find out that resveratrol, usually something from grapes or from wine, did protect against radiation exposure. But, and this appears in the ACS Medicinal Chemistry Letters, what they discovered is, is not all resveratrol protects against radiation. They found that resveratrol protected cells in flasks but did not protect it actually in mice or living organism. However, acetylated resveratrol did protect the animals in mice from radiation damage. Acetylated resveratrol is also inexpensive. So when looking for your choice of resveratrol, especially for radiation protection, try to make sure it's acetylated. And that's the one you want to look for. All right, after that, H. pylori, back in the news. Don't get rid of it yet. Basically what they found out that the DNA from H. pylori, a common stomach bacteria, minimized the effect of colitis in mice. And that was just one. This came out of a report from the University of Mich Michigan Medical School. What they discovered is that basically the majority of infected individuals with H. pylori may never develop any ulcers or cancers. I think it came out that 15% develop ulcers, 1% may develop cancers. But the benefit far outweighed that. The research basically showed them the further evidence that we should leave these bugs alone. This is in no words. There may be a benefit to hosting them in the stomach, meaning don't kill them with antibiotics the first time it's detected, like many of the people out there are doing. They said H. pylori has coexisted with the human race for more than 50,000 years, as far as we know. And although it was linked with peptic ulcer disease and stomach cancer, all minority affected patients will ever develop these complications. They said the H. pylori infection is more commonly found in developing countries or those with poor sanitation. Why? Because it's virtually very little incidence of colitis, salmonella, or other inflammatory bowel diseases. The study, researchers found that H. pylori is uniquely immunosuppressive in a good way, that high numbers of sequences have known to also inhibit inflammation. They found that mice receiving H. pylori DNA lost less weight when they had colitis, less bleeding, and greater stool consistency. Now guess after how many doses of H. pylori? Just one. They said with one dose, there was a significant difference in the bleeding and inflammation in the colon. In previous research, the University of Michigan gastroenterologists also found that H. pylori reduced the severity of inflammation of the colon by salmonella. Remember, salmonella used to be a plague. We did this before. H. pylori basically helped us evolve past that salmonella poisoning. It is amazing that the bacterial DNA not only directs the biological behavior of bacteria, but also has significant influence in the gut immunity of the host. The information may have important implications down the line with us in regards to disease manifestation. So something to think about. There is a strong benefit to H. pylori. Don't wipe it all out, get it in balance. That's the main thing. After that, we go to another demonized thing which is highly necessary in our diet, LDL cholesterol. And this is in a titled article called Bad Cholesterol, Not As Bad As People Thinks. Shows Texas A&M University uh, News Information Services especially, also published in the Journal of Gerontology. Their work with Pittsburgh, with the University of Pittsburgh, Kent State University, John Hopkins Weight Management Center, and Northern Ontario School of Medicine. So this isn't just one research or one research lab. The studies showed, especially when it came to exercise, that after fair, fairly vigorous workouts, participants who had gained the most muscle mass also had the highest levels of LDL bad cholesterol. 
It showed that you need LDL to gain more muscle. It could explain why a lot of people on cholesterol lowering medications, cholesterol lowering medication, are in pain all the time, especially muscle pain, because the LDL is required to build more muscle, especially you people out there working out. Now, with my experience with athletes, they've always had consistently high LDL levels, and yet they never could figure out because their diets were so freaking clean. They also said that LDL serves a very, these are their quotes, not mine, LDL serves a very useful purpose. It acts as a warning sign that something is wrong, and it signals the body. The LDL signals the body to these warning signs. It is doing the job it is supposed to do. It is like finding water next to a fire. Look for the fire engines and the firemen. Then find the fire and put it out. Don't shut the water valve off because all you see is things all wet. People often say, I want to get rid of all my bad LDL. But the fact is, if you do, you would die. We need to change the idea that LDL is always being evil. We all need it. We need it to do the job. And the more LDL you have in the blood, the better you are able to build muscle during resistance training. The study could also be helpful looking at sarcopenia where people get muscle wasting as they get older, they may not want to be lowering that LDL or giving cholesterol medications that can mimic the effect of sarcopenia. Oh, that'd be a good one. Mm. All right, after that, let's look at bone building. Well, the first articles are coming out knocking the bisphosphonates, the biophosphonates that are out there. University of Illinois, also published in a recent issue of Nutrients, found out the best thing to do is to take calcium and vitamin D, not the bisphosphonates. They said, and they knocked them really heavy, they said the scientists that prescription bone building medications are expensive and have many side effects, including, ironically, an increase in hip fractures and jaw necrosis. They should only be used if diets and supplements don't do the trick. So get away from your lazy doctors that just want to prescribe you these drugs. Bisphosphonates, for instance, disrupt Normal bone remodeling by shutting down the osteoclast, the cells that break down old bone and make new bone. When that happens, the bone is built on top of old bone. Yes, your bone density is higher, but the bone is not structurally sound. A bone density test does not measure the quality of the bone itself. That's something to think about. And they looked at 219 studies over 10 years. Calcium and vitamin D beat them all in true efficacy. All right, now I'm kind of running out of time. So I wanted to basically show you what diabetes drug makes you fatter. It's a class of drugs called TZDs, or thiosolinodiones. What they are is your Avendia and your Avendia metamorphin combinations. But what they had to do is they're quite protective, they said, and they make you fatter. So the excess nutrients can be stored in your fat tissues. They said that's why these TCDs are so effective at lower glucose. The extra fat cells produce, become the storage containers for nutrients that would otherwise be harmful if stored in the other side of the other, other parts of the body. So in effect, making you much, much fatter to store all that good sugar. Well, my time is up and thank you for the time. Thank you very much. We appreciate you joining us. Do your research upon the subject matter we've talked about and whatever else will suit you. Thank you very much. Very interesting, huh?